Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part two of our discussion of Iron Man's novel, The Fountainhead. If you'd like to find out more about this podcast, you can do so at thevoluntarylife.com. So thank you so much for listening, and on with part two. I did want to ask you, because we've kind of, you know, we've, we've, we've found a lot of... Uh, Flaws, uh, yeah. things crawling around under the uh, <laughs> under the stone there with this book but I did want to ask you because I know when I talked to you about the book club and I said which Iron Man book should we do and you said The Fountainhead was the one that you you know the, that was the one that sort of stood out for you and you also mentioned at the beginning of this call that you'd read the book like three or four times mm-hmm. and so I wanted to ask you like, why have you read this book three or four times and what is it about this book that that, um, that you really treasure? Oh, the book, the book is, let me just give you my hymn of praise. I mean, the, the book is spectacular on, on so many levels. Uh, it is uh, an absolute hymn to strength of character, to integrity, to, to uh, honesty, to courage. Uh, it is completely magnificent. It is scathing and denunciatory in the good Russian tradition, if not the good Jewish tradition. It is scathing in its attack upon villainy. And that kind of moral clarity landed like a complete meteor in the still oceans of relativism that I grew up in. And so I thought that it was completely magnificent. It's, it's clear delineations between good and evil. Uh, it's, it's massive praise to, to the power of integrity. The, the optimism in the amount of hardship that the virtuous have to endure before achieving their success. That is, that to me was all just completely uh, unknown, unexpected, unprecedented, and and magnificent. Uh, of course, uh, I shouldn't say of course, but I spent. Uh, <laughs> I was definitely on the road to Peter Keatingville. I felt when I read when I first read the book, uh, simply because uh, I did have. I mean, I'm a much more destructive and and uh, an evil mother than than his, but had that creepy single kid, because my brother was gone so much, uh, either in England or elsewhere, uh, that sort of creepy um, uh, single kid of a single crazy mom thing, where there's that lamprey-like attachment to your manhood and, and all of that. And I really felt that was a, a very chilling portrayal. Uh, and it, it illuminated so much of what motivated people around me, this idea of integrity, of which I knew nobody uh, who, was, who was interested in, in that. Or I shouldn't say I knew one guy. Uh, and I really liked this, this second-hander, uh, idea that, that people don't ask what is true, but what the people believe is true, that people will try to just get away. They will use virtue as a cover to just get away with as much as they can based on social approval. I thought that was magnificent and powerful and sustained me during many a dark time uh, in my life. I thought Dominique was a ridiculous character, but I mean, <laughs> you've got to fill 600 pages for something, <laughs> right? So uh, I thought Dominique was ridiculous because she was only in demand because of her beauty, not because she was a nice person. And, of course, Ayn Rand, like, like I think just about everybody, has a complex relationship with uh, physical beauty. I think she did not feel beautiful herself and so poured a lot of her uh, relationship with beauty, and particularly because she was drawn to the movies where beauty would reigned. Uh, so I, I, I thought Dominique was ridiculous, but that didn't really matter. I thought the rape scene was crazy and, and, and scary, but... Uh, to me, those are like, there are sunspots on the sun. That doesn't mean that it's midnight, <laughs> that you can still get a hell of a lot of light out of that ball of fire. And so I, I found that there was, uh, and, and the, the depth and clarity of thought, uh, which uh, as, a, as a, she's a better philosopher than novelist, in my opinion, and I think she's a damn fine novelist. The book is interesting, engaging, gripping. It has great twists. It's got a good, great plot. Uh, I, I've always envied Ayn Rand for her plots. She's like, way better than I could ever dream of being as a, as a writer uh, in terms of plot. And so I thought it was, uh, it was just incandescent. It was just a, a fantastic, uh, electrifying ball of light that exploded in my world and uh, really set me down the path because I saw so much of what was great in the book and I saw even dimly at the time so many of its flaws and that, of course, is the most encouraging thing, because if it was a completely perfect book, it'd be like, okay, well, nobody's going to write anything anymore. Nobody, it's all done, right? But where there's enough light to light the way, but not enough to get you to the destination, that to me was the most motivating thing of all, that I felt that I could have something over time to add to, to what had been done. And uh, so it's it, it, with, without, without a doubt, the single most influential book that I've ever read. Uh, I can't imagine that I will ever read a book as influential again. Um, 
So from that standpoint, uh, I'm, I'm just a massive fan. With the limitations and all of that, you know, and we can put that in its cultural context. I mean, this was written in the 40s uh, uh, by a woman not in her native language. Uh, so with all of that, I just thought, what, you know, what a stellar and magnificent achievement. And, you know, not to dwell too much on the flaws, but just, just to focus on how much was achieved in terms of thought and plot and content by a non-native speaker and a woman to boot, I mean, I just thought it was it was magnificent achievement, and still is. I'm totally with you on the um, on the moral clarity and on the the also the the portrayal of even though the virtue is a little bit mixed up in some parts, but the portrayal of you know um, the virtuous people and the struggles that they go through and the optimism that you mentioned, I, I think that is that is wonderful in this book. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've certainly appreciated it a little bit more since starting FDR, right? I mean, I, I have my, my two E's in a way and, and all of that, so, uh, so I, can, I can really understand where she was coming from. More so, like the more, more of a stand that you take for, for virtue and courage in the world, I mean, you get a lot of support and you get your trolls, right? So uh, I, can, I can appreciate that, uh, that all the more. So, yeah, I, I, I recommend the book to, to just about to just about everyone, to, it's a, to, and and it doesn't matter. See, it doesn't matter to me fundamentally when if if she makes mistakes in in content, that doesn't matter. Like Francis Bacon wouldn't be able to get a job teaching grade one science uh, in the world today, though he was the one who first delineated the scientific method in its modern format. So the fact that and the fact that that Sir Isaac Newton was into numerology and and all this kind of mystical shit, it doesn't. The fact that Pascal was into <laughs> Christianity, that doesn't matter. Like it doesn't. It, it didn't matter to me that she got things wrong because it's the moral clarity that counts, right? So she really invented a way of working on moral clarity and and all of that. And so the fact that she made mistakes doesn't matter because what what we take out of Rand, at least what I try to take out of Rand is that dedication to clarity. So she didn't follow reason and evidence sometimes. So what? I mean, <laughs> that doesn't matter. The fact is that reason and evidence should be followed. And, and, and the fact is that moral clarity is important. The fact is that your conscience will get you whether you like it or not if you act in an immoral way in the world. All of this, to me, was just such a, an illumination that it didn't matter to me that Dominique slash Rand liked it kind of rough and dirty. I mean, <laughs> it didn't really matter because the, it's, it's the process, not the content, that was so illuminating to me. I, it just occurred to me that you could see Howard Rourke, because he's a bit of a non-character in a way, Howard Rourke. He doesn't have an arc, right? There's no, there's no story arc to Howard Rourke. As we talked about, he just is virtue, and he sort of just goes through life being, you know, the sort of embodiment of pure virtue. There is no... There isn't really a character development. So you could say that he's more of an ideal or, or maybe even like a ecosystem character of virtue inside all of the others' heads. And the other characters, like Peter Keating, has a real story arc. I mean, he has a relationship to Howard Rourke, which his relationship, if, if Rourke is virtue, then he goes through this whole sort of self-loathing, tortuous development of how he, you know, and the, his mother's influence on him and his career, and he has this whole success, and, and then he realizes that actually it didn't really get him anywhere and that he's, you know, he actually has sort of kind of lost the chance for happiness. So he's got, he's, as you were describing earlier, he, I think he's a very richly described character and the whole development of how he works and is, is done very, with a great deal of empathy with the whole situation with his um, with his mother, um, Dominique is just a, a bit of a nut job and not really. I mean, she's, I suppose, she's got a story arc in that she's kind of, you know, she's the. It, and in, in, this is it's a very nineteen forties kind of. Uh, you see this in some movies. It's the kind of uptight woman who meets her bit of rough, and then she kind of discovers herself. You know what I mean? And oh that, yeah, no, like um, like Oscar Wilde. But anyway, go on. <laughs> So she's sort of got an arc, but, you know, it's because she's a bit insane, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't hold together that much. I thought Gail Wineland was going to have an, a really interesting story arc because, you know, he's, he's a character who does develop and you do see his, his whole perspective change um, when, when he meets Raw. And there's, like, some seriously gay undertones in their relationship, which must be... Like there must have been something else going on there, but um, 
But then I felt that his character sort of, I don't know, it felt like she needed to get him out of the way at the end so that Dominique could get it together with Howard because cause he sort of falls short of being virtuous, but then he kind of tries to catch up at the end by giving Rourke a job and stuff. It's kind of, I didn't really get that. What did you think about the Gail Wynan character and his, his journey? Well, it's, it's a huge strain when you're trying to make a point with a character to have that character be alive, but also to make the point that you're trying to make the character make. And Gail Wynand, of course, was the idea that seeking power over people is to be a slave. But, but I, 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 and I think the whole Gail Wynand thing could have been dropped from the novel because you already have that with Peter Keating. I mean, I felt that it was a repetition. I mean, he's like a butch Peter Keating. And, and I just felt that the repetition, it's like, I got it. <laughs> seeking power over others is to be a slave. I got it. And, of course, so you've got Peter Keating doing it, you've got Gail Wynan doing it, you've got Ellsworth Tui doing it and telling you all about it. And I did feel a little bit like a baby seal on the Canadian tundra with the point being <laughs> sort of clubbed into me over and over. So uh, I think that it was a mistake to keep – I think it kept people away from the book to have it so long, and I think that it was not necessary because the, the uh, story had already been, been uh, repeated. Uh, the theme had already been repeated so many times. Uh, so I agree with you. He's there. Uh, it's the middle third of the book, or I guess a little fourth of the fifth book or whatever. Uh, so it, it, you know, it fills up some pages, and she gets to marry somebody else uh, who Howard Rock doesn't like, which I thought was a, uh, you know, we already did this with Peter Keating. I got it. We don't need to do it again. <laughs> and uh, so I think, I think that the book would have been better served. I mean, the one thing that Ayn Rand did not take well to was editing, and uh, I think the book would have been better served if it had been shorter, but, you know, this is, uh, I think Bohemian Rhapsody should have been slightly faster. I mean, you know, the moment I write a better book, I'll feel more qualified to, to really critique one of the most successful books of all time, so uh, that's just sort of my, my opinion. I didn't particularly warm to the Gale uh, wine and uh, bit, although it was nice to see Howard Rock, Howard Rock with a friend, and it was nice to see that Howard Rock had that sort of instinctual liking of him, despite his uh, corruption and uh, or despite Gail Wynand's corruption and all that, so uh, I thought it was I thought it was interesting, but it didn't didn't really grip me. The stuff that really gripped me in the book was just that first third where everything was being set up and endings are notoriously difficult in all forms of art. So uh, yeah, I just it, it's always a disappointment for me in, in most stories when you get to, to near the end, or you, you just feel like you know you either ran out of money or just had to say, send it in or. Or whatever. So uh, I, I think, um, and, and I tried to do that with the God of Atheists in my own small way, was to not make it blow up, to not make it big. Uh, and I've done that. I did that in Revolutions as well, to not make it, you know. And now we take on the universe and <laughs> we march through time uh, to to keep the story small and intimate because that's where we live our lives. That's where our morals show up is in our relationships where things are fairly small and intimate. And so I tried very much to to learn from that. You know, again, not counting myself a billionth as successful a novelist as Ayn Rand, but um, that was certainly my approach. And maybe that's what people need. Maybe it seems kind of decadent to need that kind of big, tall tales. You know, uh, I, that's not where people actually have to make their moral decisions in their life. And uh, I thought that her romantic streak, in a, it, it's, part of, it's part of what I talked about in the Heroism series. It's just trying to keep ethics at a distance for people by making it so big. You know, it's it's about blowing up houses and it's about running newspapers into the ground and all of that. Well, this is not choices that people are going to face in their lives. Um, to me, I, I was really hoping at the, book, at the book that it was going to be a tale of Peter Keating struggling to liberate himself from his abusive mother. I mean, isn't that isn't that the kind of shit that people actually have to deal with in their lives? Not, you know, this, this big melodramatic stuff. But uh, And I was willing to take it because, you know, there was so much great stuff in the book. It's like, okay... We'll go big, but, you know, I, I wish we'd gone home instead, you know. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point that actually, you know, in a, in a sense, it, he was just the, the the big Hollywood version of the Peter Keating idea, you know. <laughs> it's just, in a sense, Pete, Peter Keating already contains all of those um, uh, bad roads to go down. And Gail Wynan just does it with a lot more cash and a nice yacht. Right, and, and comes to the same end. Yeah, yeah. Steph, I wanted to ask you about the uh, blowing up the... Um... <laughs> that was a good sound effect for the question. Complete the sound effect. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> 
Remember, um, it's tell, not show. Anyway. <laughs> they're, they're blowing up the, um, the housing project because that really, <laughs> to me, that was like, huh? <laughs> I mean, it, you know, for because, I mean, it's sort of such a disconnect that... Um, no, but, you know, you, when you're writing a... Ph- sorry, I'm going to interrupt you just because this, I thought about this a lot, and hopefully I'll keep it brief, but when you're writing a philosophical novel, I'll tell you this directly, you, you need speeches. You need speeches. And how the hell are you going to do speeches in a philosophical novel? Well, in Atlas Shrugged, basically, you just corner people at a party and talk to them until their eyelids fall off, right? But, but <laughs> when she was earlier in her novel writing career, you have this big problem. I mean, I had the same problem in The God of Atheists. How the hell do you have speeches? Because people don't give speeches much, I should say this. <laughs> I shouldn't say this at this particular moment. But people don't give a lot of speeches in life, like right? when you're just chatting with people, right? I mean, with barbecues or when you come up for Christmas or whatever. I mean, we have conversations, right? We, nobody gives 20-minute speeches. And so the question is, how the hell do you get speeches across in a, uh, in a philosophical novel? Well, I used uh, a web blog, right? Uh, Rudy has his, uh, his web blog. Um, and uh, that's how I gave him the speeches that were necessary uh, for the book. Um, and it's a big problem. Dostoevsky faces the same problem. Everybody who's a moralist faces that same problem, which is how the hell do you get a moral speech in that doesn't look ridiculous? And the traditional way to do it is a courtroom, right? Because in a courtroom, you have, you know, if you've ever watched Boston Legal, right, he, the guy gets these uh, monstrous speeches uh, and just goes on and on. And that's okay because it's not a conversational setting. It is a courtroom where this is expected. So she needed to get him into a courtroom in order for him to give the speech that sums up what she'd already told you 20 times before. Uh, <laughs> but, okay, for the guy who's got 1,600 podcasts, I'm not going to complain about that. But um, she needed to get him into a courtroom so she could get him a big speech. And to get him into a courtroom, she needs either trumped-up charges to be laid against him. But that's that, if you have trumped-up charges laid, laid against the character, that character looks somewhat passive and reactive. So she wanted him to act in such a way that he would end up in a courtroom, seemingly to do something wrong, but in fact to create to, to make this big this big speech. So that's my guess. It was more of a technical thing to solve than a genuine inspiration. And she did, as I said, struggle for a long time with how to end the book. And I think every writer has gone through that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing. Right. Because but yeah, he... it makes no sense. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, it, it makes no sense given his character, given uh, the, the, the theme of the book, given anything. The orbit of the moon d- defies it, right? I mean, it makes no sense because why, why would he care? You know, he is the generative power. I mean, if he could handle Dominique marrying Peter Keating... Why would he care about a fucking building? Like, it makes no sense at all. Uh, it's complete, the proportion makes no sense. His reaction makes no sense. Blowing things up makes no sense. Uh, it's, uh, it is, you know, it, but it's just one of these things where you just go, okay, I guess, I guess we're going here. I, I'm fairly okay with that sort of stuff in art because you just get kind of used to it. Like, okay, I guess we're going here. And, and you just go and you hope it's going to be an entertaining journey, and it is. But, yeah, I mean, from, from the larger sphere of things, it was... It's the addiction to, to melodrama and the need for a, a, um, a speech that makes some kind of sense. Uh, but, of course, she gave Tui a great speech with Peter Keating, even though there was no courtroom or anything. So, uh, but, of course, uh, Tui is a sadist, and the speech is sadistic to, to torture Peter Keating, right? As I've always said, the, the devil shows you the nature of your soul only after he's taken it for good. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's sort of my take on it. it. It's deranged, but I think she felt it was necessary to get the speech in. But it does really, I mean, having them act so clearly blatant violation of their own virtues does kind of, it, it, it sort of sticks in your craw a bit, doesn't it? I mean, because kind of, you're kind of in the middle of, like, here are these people who are supposed to be uh, living the virtues, and then you go and blow shit up, you know? <laughs> Right, but but what were, what was her option? Right, her, her option to have Howard Rock triumph in the real world would be to have him uh, examine himself. Right? right, to have him sit down and say, "If I love Dominique, a why do I love this twelve pounds of crazy in a four pound bag? Right, why why do I love this woman?" And and secondly, why do I look upon my own emotions with this cold critical distance? Right, because there's this passage which Brandon quotes back as destructive to to healthy psychological functioning, where 
where Rourke says, you know, he could feel his pain within himself and he turned and he looked at it coldly and critically and kept it at a distance and the pain only goes down so far and then it stops and, you know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any empathy with himself. Uh, mm. You know, I mean, if the woman I, I loved married the man who was my greatest enemy, if such a thing could be conceived, then I, I'd, I'd be like curled in a fetal position, sucking my thumb and shitting tears, right? I mean, it would just be, be awful and, and beyond painful. And he's just like, ah, pain. <laughs> he's very Vulcan, right? You know, it's like yeah. interesting human emotion. So for me, Howard Rourke, for, for the novel to end in a way that would be truly helpful and uplifting, I think, in the long run, to, to objectivists, right? Because the effect of this book upon objectivists is, I think, particularly chilling, would, would be for him to say, look, I maybe, I maybe have all this integrity and so on, but there's something wrong with me. There's something, something is not functioning well in my system if I'm this detached from my own experience. And I think that, to me, would have been a very powerful thing to do. Uh, again, it's something that I tried to do in The God of Atheists, which was to have people say, yes, there's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with me because I'm not able to change the world. And so there's only one other variable that's open to my change. And that is something that uh, Howard Rourke wasn't able to do. So he's got to blow up buildings and make speeches and, and so on and put himself in an artificially dangerous situation in order to be rescued and have a triumph at the end. But to me, the triumph at the end was, you know, I, I remember thinking uh, shortly after I read The Fountainhead, and then they had kids, you know? <laughs> you know then, then Howard and Dominique had kids, and then what, right? I mean, to the sequel, would they, would they be good parents? Would they be empathetic and caring and patient and gentle parents and all that? And it would be hard to imagine how they could be. So, uh, so to me, there was a sequel that would be more tragedy than triumph. Yeah, God, Dominique is a mum. That'd be scary. Oh, my God. Ayn Rand is a mum. And Howard is the, is the you know, uh, basically, uh, God knows what he's thinking or feeling dad, you know. That was yeah, the, you, you, have, you have skinned your knee, lick it, and keep walking. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he would say, but it would be oh, nice. Pain only goes so far. <laughs> yeah, pain only goes so far, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, so I, I, that, that glaring lack of self-knowledge, which you can see all over the objectivist movement, uh, is, um, I mean, to me, this is why it hasn't achieved the kind of change that, that philosophy should. You know, this is, this is so frustrating when it comes to philosophy, is the people who are into self-knowledge are into relativism, and the people who aren't into relativism are, aren't into self-knowledge. It's like, damn it, can we not just get these two to shake hands over dinner, you know? Can we not get self-knowledge and objectivity? Uh, can we not get self-knowledge and reason and evidence to shake hands? So we don't get Socrates and Plato who are into self-knowledge and have the ethics of a cat in a blender as far as objectivity goes. You know, can we not get, we have to go to that pole so you get self-knowledge but no objectivity. Or to be at the other pole where you've got objectivity but self-knowledge is considered to be some sort of rabid dog that will eat your face off. I just really wanted to try and get, get the two together, right, so that you could go inwards without losing objectivity and you could also go out into the objectivity without losing the self-knowledge. That was the, the stuff that I've been trying to hold together in, in what I've been doing. That's a really, that's a great way of summarizing actually. To, to, to bring those two parts together so that you can go inwards and outwards in, in the way that you just described. Mm, thanks. Thanks so much. It's been really good fun, and uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for taking part. And uh, look forward to talking to you soon at the next one. Thanks so much for your input, Steph. That was oh, great. Oh, my pleasure. Have a great day, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.